we're moving out on another episode of Military Collectors. Our destination this week, Levittown, Pennsylvania, Army Jeep Parts. Stay tuned for more on Military Collectors. Roger that. On this week's Military Collectors, I want to talk specifically about the term restoration. I'm going to be having a friend of mine who I've known for quite some time who's going to provide me with some advice. And really, this is something you all need to pay attention to because restoration means a lot of different things to a lot of people. Especially when you're talking about collecting vehicles, airplanes, firearms, you name it, anything military. Or for that matter, civilian, what does restoration mean? different terminologies, on-frame, off-frame. And so when you use those terms, it does mean a lot of different things, especially when you get ready to buy one. And so what I'm going to try to do today is to help all you collectors out there who may be thinking about taking the dip, but really don't understand what you're buying. I've been there, done that, okay? I've heard the term restored, completely restored. But when I got it, that's not the case. My specimen here today in the motor pool is a 1951 M38. This is a Korean War vintage Willys. It is a completely off-frame restoration, every nut, bolt, you name it, this was done, and I bought it that way. I'm going to feature a friend of mine from Levittown, Pennsylvania, George Baxter, President and CEO of Army Jeep Parts. George has been in the business over 40 years, actually since he was 13, and he's going to tell us as an advisor, as an expert, a guy that's been in this business for a long time, exactly what restored means to him and what it could possibly mean to you if you want to get into collecting a military collectible, preserve history for the future. Well folks, Military Collectors heads to Levittown, Pennsylvania this week and I've got a good friend of mine and somebody I have contributed a lot of money to in my personal collection and that's George Baxter. He's the President and CEO of Army Jeep Parts. Remember that, armyjeepparts.com. But George, listen, thanks for inviting us up to Army Jeep Parts here in Levittown. It's, it's really a pleasure to be here because I tell you what, there's a lot of history here. Over 40 years have you been doing this and you know, folks, I had to kid him a while ago because he doesn't have a gray hair in his head. But, you know, George, the big question that I want to talk to you about in this first segment on the show is, is restoration. Okay, right. everybody's talking about restoration. And what I find going around the country is what does restoration mean to experts like you? So talk to me a little bit about those levels of restoration. You know, a lot of guys talk about motor pool ready, every nut and bolt, off frame, on frame, all that. So help me help our viewers out there talk sure. about restoration. Sure. It's a good question because the word restoration is thrown around very freely these days and has been for years. It's not a new issue. Um, you see a vehicle advertised, frame off restoration. Um, and more often than not, when that vehicle is actually inspected, the reality is quite otherwise. I mean, I, I'll kid guys and they say, well, you can run down to Walmart, buy a can of OD paint and you can do a restoration, right? So, well, no, a restoration is not a paint job. And a lot of guys seem to think that if you make the motor pretty, well, then it's a restored motor. And of course, maybe they're not trying to be too uh, transparent or honest about what they've done with their vehicle when they advertise it and call it a restoration. But it's rare that I'll find a vehicle that is in fact advertised as a frame off ground up restoration really to be true. Um, they've usually cut corners. If you start asking questions like, well, did you really tear that front axle down to a bare case? Did you pull every bearing out of it? Did you check, inspect every seal? That well, well, no, we, we, we looked at it, we, you know, whatever, you knew, you knew right away, okay. So at that point, it's an immediate telltale that, well, in fact, it was probably more cosmetic. Yeah, they rebuilt the motor. Well, the transmission seemed okay, so we just cleaned it up and painted it. Okay, so, so at that point, you're already off in the bushes at that point. So, you know, okay, so we know that advertisement was false, okay. So to find the one, that really has been done that way. Truly, every down, every darn nut and bolt has been taken off and out of that thing, been taken apart, replated, whatever was needed to be done. But the price will always be, usually, the indicator. Well, George, 
what a magnificent specimen of a restored Jeep. And I, I, you know, since you were 13, okay, and I've got to give away your age. You're 53, so that's been over 40 years ago as a kid. But I have to show our viewers out there exactly what restoration means because, again, not only to a youngster, but when did you take this thing down and, and redo it? Uh, like I said, I bought it in 77. Um, I finished it my senior year in high school. I was 81. Um, and that's when I first showed it. Actually, I showed it in 80 and then I showed it in 81. Um, exact so. frame off restoration, every yeah, nut, this, every this, bolt. I mean, there again, this was my first experience in a proper down to bare nothing frame. So I, I was sort of self taught on a lot of my skills. My dad was an earnest uh, wrench turner. Uh, his skills were not always um, on the higher end of the spectrum, but he always would. Uh, give a lot of effort into taking stuff apart. wasn't always successful on the reassembly, um, but um, but he encouraged me in a way that only a loving father can. And so he he fanned the fire and uh, and let me go. And he, so well, I have to ask you one specific question, okay? For for the collectors out there, okay? Mm -hmm. And and there are there are hundreds of thousands of us, okay? Just like you, just like me, and folks are going to be interested in this show. From your advice, okay, from your seat in all this business, is there one Jeep that's more collectible than another? I know that's a loaded question, yeah, that's a but question. is there something that somebody ought to go after? Because, you know, the World War II Jeeps, there's a lot more of them made. Then you get into the Korea era, um, not so many. And then, of course, when you get into the Vietnam, the 151. So of those families, of those three over those courses of war, which, which one do you think is more collectible? Well, the World War II has always been considered king of the collector Jeep world. Um, now, as time goes by here and that generation ages out and, and dies, um, and not necessarily those that fought in the war, but those that still have that touchstone, that grew up with a memory or a very close memory of hearing about World War II. Um, so, as a result, the World War II Jeep was sort of always the uh, the prototypical Jeep that was sought after. Beyond that, it, it comes down to probably more what you are after. So, um, and do you want a flat fender Jeep? Some guys, that look to them, that's all they want. And that could be a 38, that could be an MB, it could be a CJ for that matter, a 2A or a 3A. But they want that flat fender look is something that's an intangible and that's all they want. Yeah. Um, others don't care. If, if it's OD and it's proper pedigree as a military Jeep, you know, that could be a 38A1, it could be an M151. Um, so, and then of course, the cost of what your budget is. Right. So where are you budgeting wise to, to buy a Jeep that's either a basket case and be invested in doing the restoration yourself or know that, okay, you don't have the skills that are needed or required to do that restoration. So you're much better off at that point going out and buying a Jeep that has been restored. Coming up on Military Collectors, well, we're back at the motor pool, but I've got to talk to you about a key piece on our show this week. George Baxter is going to take us through the carburation. You know, you can have the best collectible, the finest restored vehicle, but I will tell you, if the carburetor is not good, it don't run, it don't work, then you don't have a collectible that you can drive and enjoy. So we're going to talk carburation and we're going to kind of take you through it A to Z on this week's Military Collectors. Military Collectors is brought to you today by GovPlanet, your online auction site for government equipment, by Chevrolet, Chevrolet, find new roads, and by the South Carolina National Guard Museum. Discover the Palmetto State's military history. How's it going? Hi. Today we're going to be comparing the roll-formed high-strength steel bed of the Chevy Silverado to the aluminum bed of this competitor's truck. Awesome. All right, let him drop. <laughs> Let's see how the aluminum bed of this truck held up. Wow. Holy That's holy. a good size puncture. That's all the way through, for sure. Full-on crack here. Here, aluminum now, you're going to go, Ugh. Let's check out the Silverado steel bed. Wow. Yeah, a couple dents. I'd expect more dents. Chevy clearly held up better than the Ford. Travel back into time 
Experience how America gained its freedom and fought to keep it. Come see up close the weaponry and the stories of the United States military from 1670 to present day at the South Carolina Military Museum in Columbia, South Carolina. The South Carolina Military Museum is one of the largest military museums in the country, and its mission is to honor and chronicle the American soldier with artifacts and exhibits. The South Carolina Military Museum, preserving our military legacy for all generations. If you're in the market for military surplus for recreation or construction, or you just want to own a piece of military history, go online to GovPlanet.com's weekly auction. GovPlanet has auctions every Wednesday, where you can find and bid on numerous items. All items are protected by ironclad insurance, which makes sure that what's in GovPlanet's report is what you're getting. Be sure to join GovPlanet every Wednesday for their weekly auction, and check in often to see their ever-changing inventory. GovPlanet, your online auction site for government equipment. Roger that. Well, welcome back to the show. Carburation, well, it's a key to any restoration of a military vehicle, airplane. I don't care if it runs, it's got to have a carburetor that works. And again, you've got to have somebody that knows how to do that. And you know, one of the key pieces, just because it says it's new old stock, and especially if you're buying something out there to replace or to restore your carburetor on your Jeep, just because it says it's new old stock, still in the wrapper, that doesn't mean all the seals and the gaskets and all that stuff are, are good to go. And so with that, George is going to kind of take us through it, A to Z, exactly what good carburation is all about on your military Jeep. A lot of you collectors out there probably talk to George or Megan or somebody here because you've had to have something for your Jeep. But I will tell you right now, if you don't have a carburetor that functions, you're not going to have a Jeep that runs nor you're going to be able to enjoy it. And so George... Tell me about the series. You do all the family of Jeep carburation systems, and we're going to move in here because not only do you have them available, but you fix them, and that's a big deal. Yeah, we do do uh, all the carburetors for the World War II series, the M38, the 38A1, and the M151 series. So basically all the military Jeeps that are out there today, we do rebuild the carburetors for any of those series. We also do the early CJs, uh, CJ2, CJ3s, which is essentially the same as the World War II carburetor. There are some uh, technical differences, but they are fully interchangeable uh, with a WO from World War II to a CJ post war one or vice versa. Um, if you're doing a high-end restoration, then you're gonna want the specific one that's for World War II, which is harder to find. So, but all of our carburetors are basically treated the same way in terms of the process. Um, you can see cores here, uh, typical of what would come in from a customer. Um, in some cases, they'll come in after we've shipped the core new rebuilt carburetor to them. And in some instances, they'll send them in ahead of time. Uh, they might want theirs back for some reason specifically, so we'll accommodate them whatever they want to do. Um, so all of our carburetors, they're cleaned in uh, carburetor material, uh, it's a chemical that strips them. We also have an ultrasonic system to clean them even more thoroughly. All the steel components are sent out and re-zinc plated, including the internal butterflies. Um, and our bases uh, are, are reparkerized. Most and a lot of rebuilders you will see are painted black. Uh, that is not how the factory did it. They parkerized them. It's a much more durable finish. Right. Paint, of course, and gasoline don't typically like each other. So we send the bases out bare, get them reparkerized per factory. If we have to recolor the castings, we have that and we do that in house. Um, if the material on there is okay, then we'll preserve it and we won't redo it. Um, so after each carburetor is fully assembled, then we will put it on a four cylinder uh, test dam. It'll be run for 15 to 20 minutes, set up for mixture, set up for idle, and it's fully guaranteed. Well, I have to ask you about one specific uh, carburetor here and I'm gonna grab it, okay? Let me just walk over here. now. For all M151 folks, and that's me too, okay? And I, I haven't really been able to uh, <clears throat> quite afford a World War II, so you're going to have to help me with that down the road. But that's another subject for another we'll day. We'll see if we can work on okay. it. Okay. But listen, this carburetor here, okay, for all of you folks out there who have an M151, and you don't know what this one is, is and, probably... And when he says that, he means straight 151. That's true. The, the early 151, uh, not the A1, not the A2, but... And you see these parts for sale, but I have never, this is the first time I've ever had my hands on mm -hmm. this carburetor. Tell the folks out there about this one. Well, the early generations built by Ford, um, first series, second series uh, on the 151, they contracted their carburetors to be built by Holley. 
and Holly built a waterproof carburetor and if anything they made it too well um, too efficient and so this is this is a core uh, and then this is one that's completely been gone through tested guaranteed that's how basically as close as you're going to look to a factory new carburetor for a holly and anyway this carburetor was uh, too too good uh, if there's such thing but in the case of the m151 combined with the tendency to roll if you weren't driven in a certain manner um, you threw in more horsepower with this carburetor and it was double trouble so the government realized pretty early on that they needed to do something with regards to the power so, so private so, baxters with lead feet did not want to have this carburetor on their jeep <laughs> Uh, no, they probably did, but <laughs> but but the commanding officer and from the top down said, "Hell no, Jim, you're having too much fun in that Jeep, so we're going to get that carburetor off there." So there was a modification work order, basically to strip these off all 151s and replace it with the Bendix carburetor, which is a detuned model. Does it run and do everything else relatively well? Yeah, it, most of that's everybody who's driven a 151. That's their experience. That's what they know, and it does the job just fine. Carburation is truly one of the most important things in order to make your military restored vehicle run the way it's supposed to so you can enjoy it. Well, coming up, we're going to talk about what it takes to do the rest of the restoration. Every nut, every bolt, paint, you name it, George Baxter's got it at Army Jeep Parts in Levittown, Pennsylvania. If you're in the market for military surplus for recreation or construction, or you just want to own a piece of military history, go online to GovPlanet.com's weekly auction. GovPlanet has auctions every Wednesday, where you can find and bid on numerous items. All items are protected by ironclad insurance, which makes sure that what's in GovPlanet's report is what you're getting. Be sure to join GovPlanet every Wednesday for their weekly auction, and check in often to see their ever-changing inventory. GovPlanet, your online auction site for government equipment. Travel back into time. Experience how America gained its freedom and fought to keep it. Come see up close the weaponry and the stories of the United States military from 1670 to present day at the South Carolina Military Museum in Columbia, South Carolina. The South Carolina Military Museum is one of the largest military museums in the country, and its mission is to honor and chronicle the American soldier with artifacts and exhibits. The South Carolina Military Museum, preserving our military legacy for all generations. Welcome. Hi. Today we're going to be comparing the roll-formed high-strength steel bed of the Chevy Silverado to the aluminum bed of this competitor's truck. Nice. You want to grab that empty toolbox for me? Let's start here with the aluminum bed. That's wow. a big hole. Huge. We got Swiss cheese for a truck here. <laughs> I'm curious to see if that will do the same thing with the Chevy. Well, let's find out. Same spot, same angle, same empty toolbox. Took it way better. The steel held up. Silverado proved it is the toughest truck here. Roger that. One of the questions I've been asked, if I have a vehicle, it's already restored, I shouldn't need anything for it. Well, it's just like a collector car. It's like anything. Things are going to break on them. Things are going to have to be repaired. Even though this thing is a frame-off restoration, every nut, bolt, everything. But I will tell you, if you drive it in a parade or you use it for a demonstration, something is probably going to go wrong with it, and you're going to have to repair it. Well, with that, George up at Army Jeep Parts at Levittown, Pennsylvania has really got one of the finest selections of new old stock, reproduction, and takeoff vehicle parts for all of the World War II era up through Korea M151 series Jeeps. George has got it. And I'll tell you, if he doesn't have it, he can probably find it for you. That's what really is a value to any collector out there who's going to have to have any kind of a part to keep these things on the road. Really why we're here is we're here to talk about all of the parts that George has from A to Z. And I will have to tell you, just to toot his horn, from the stockage standpoint, from all of the military Jeeps in the, in the United States Army, he's probably got the largest stocking of parts right here in Levittown, Pennsylvania. And with that, I'll shut up because George, I really want you to talk about the differences in all of the Jeeps and just what the enormity about it is about stocking these things. Because again, that, that's not a small, a small project. No, it's not. I mean, you're, the fortunate aspect of it is there is a tie over from the older ones into the ones in the 50s. Um, 
And, but you know, within the models, obviously, yes, there's a lot of differences and different parts that are required depending on which model Jeep you're working on. So we try and cover soup to nuts from World War II Jeeps, early CJs, um, the M38, the 38A1, and then when you get in the M151 series, obviously it's a whole different animal. You've got no crossover essentially on those parts. That's unto themselves. I mean, there are some exceptions, but for the most part, every part that's for an M151 series is not gonna have any relationship to the previous earlier military Jeeps. So, um, so yeah, it, it's, there's a lot, a lot of inventory to handle to, to be able to cover these Jeeps well. And so when somebody calls up, we can help them with most any parts. There are, of course, exceptions, and there always will be parts that are just unobtainium or just not available currently uh, or being waiting to be reproduced or something like that. Well, you know, and that's a great point because, again, um, what do we do when the new old stock supplies and the surplus actually runs out? Okay, I mean, when it's all gone and, and you know, give me that kind of measurement. When you started this business, you know, X amount of years ago, it was this and, and now it's all this. Yeah. So briefly tell the folks out there, what are we going to do when it dries up? Well, that's a challenge. I mean, we've been dealing with that equation now for the last 10 to 15 years in terms of obviously a sliding scale. So when I bought the business back in 89 from Dave Urig out in Ohio, um, it was probably 70% new old stock. 30% reproduction. And obviously as time goes by, it's been doing this. So now we're probably 70-30 on the inverse. 70% wow. repro, you know. And there again, on the M151, not the case. My inventory is predominantly NOS. But when we're talking about World War II, Korean, and the Vietnam, not the Vietnam Jeep, but the Korean Jeeps, that's probably true, 70-30. M151, I'd say it's probably more 80% NOS, 20% repro. Wow. So, um, but yeah, it, it's an ever growing challenge, especially on the older stuff. And, uh, it's, it's a difficult one to manage because the cost of carrying that inventory goes up all the time. Well, and not only that price points do, and all those kinds of things change because again, for all of us collectors out there, we want to have something that we're proud of. It's an investment. Okay. And now to protect our investment. Okay. And a guy that regularly comes and visits here is Mark Smith. Mark, please come here and join us. Mark Smith with warjeeps.com. Hey, hey, come on hey, in come here. here. Stand in here, man. So stand next to the man. I, I've got to introduce this, this young guy right here because, again, warjeeps.com. If you don't know the value of something or you have a vehicle that you want to turn it and maybe sell it and get something else, he lives just down the road from Army Jeep Parts here in Levittown, Pennsylvania. Mark, tell us all about warjeeps.com, okay? I, I know you're the, the head publisher and, and all of that, but tell us a little bit about your site there and what guys and collectors can expect. Yeah, it's an online resource where uh, those in the hobby can place a free classified ad to sell their military Jeep. And we also um, publish articles, have videos. And in addition to that, it's, a, it's just a good online resource for those that, you know, either want to get into the hobby or, you know, they're looking to sell what they have. Military Collectors is brought to you today by GovPlanet, your online auction site for government equipment. By Chevrolet, Chevrolet, find new roads. And by the South Carolina National Guard Museum. Discover the Palmetto State's military history. If you're in the market for military surplus for recreation or construction, or you just want to own a piece of military history, go online to GovPlanet.com's weekly auction. GovPlanet has auctions every Wednesday, where you can find and bid on numerous items. All items are protected by ironclad assurance, which makes sure that what's in GovPlanet's report is what you're getting. Be sure to join GovPlanet every Wednesday for their weekly auction, and check in often to see their ever-changing inventory. GovPlanet, your online auction site for government equipment. Travel back into time. Experience how America gained its freedom and fought to keep it. Come see up close the weaponry and the stories of the United States military from 1670 to present day at the South Carolina Military Museum in Columbia, South Carolina. The South Carolina Military Museum is one of the largest military museums in the country, and its mission is to honor and chronicle the American soldier with artifacts and exhibits. The South Carolina Military Museum, preserving our military legacy for all generations. Welcome. Hi. Today we're going to be comparing the roll-formed high-strength steel bed of the Chevy Silverado to the aluminum bed of this competitor's truck. Nice. Want to grab that empty toolbox for me? Let's start here with the aluminum bed. 
That's a big hole. Huge. We got Swiss cheese for a truck here. <laughs> I'm curious to see if that will do the same thing with the Chevy. Well, let's find out. Same spot, same angle, same empty toolbox. Took it way better. The steel held up. Silverado Proof, it is the toughest truck here. Roger that. John Glover from Chicago, Illinois writes in, I am a big fan of military trucks. Can you tell me one of the best investments a new collector can make in the military truck market? Military trucks are quite large to store, so if you have the place to keep them, no problem. But if you really want something impressive that will fit in a garage, take a look at the M37 Dodge Power Wagon, a three-quarter ton four-wheel truck, not much bigger than a regular full-size pickup. Price ranges are, as found, from $3,000 to fully restored for $20,000. If you would like to have your military restoration project or collectible featured on the show, just send an email with your photos to photos at militarycollectorstv.com. I hope you've enjoyed this episode of Military Collectors from the Motor Pool here. Tell you what, we've always got a project going on in my motor pool. I hope your motor pool is going equally as well. We'll be right back here again next week on another episode of Military Collectors. <laughs>